Hello everyone, we're ready for a CCO Club webinar. We're on number 82. It's fun to have you back with us. We have a really great topic today. Question came in to the club and they wanted to know specifically about surgery coding and since we do so much of that in the educational portion of what we do, then I knew we would be able to come up with some great, like the top five, the top ten. So uh, general surgery procedures most common in the office. You know how I found them? I googled it. <laughs> You'd be surprised because I had all of these different procedures going through my head thinking, oh gosh, that's not really a big deal as far as telling somebody how to code it. But when I went in and looked at the ones that came up on the list and there were some articles in there, I thought, oh, okay, these are good ones. This is great. So I'm hoping that it will uh, help you with your coding skills. Don't forget with our CCO Club, a lot of benefits, and this is a CCO Club webinar. With the CCO Club, you get CEUs, you get support, and you get all the previous videos that we've done that are club videos. We talk about billing and coding. We talk about all of the code sets. Sometimes we talk about different credentials. There's a vast variety of things that we talk about in the club webinars. What happens is the people in the club ask the questions and then we do the research and answer them and then put them in the club so that everybody can benefit from the questions that were answered. I'm always looking for a teaching moment and the club is a great place to, to find teaching moments. We have extended product support in the club as well. Um, Several of our students are in the club. They like to go in there and get additional help. So if you are wanting to know if the CCO club is for you, not only what's bulleted here, but if you're looking for a community to network and connect with coders and peers on several levels and specialties, then the CCO club's for you. It's real easy to find, cco.us forward slash club. The question that came in was, what are the common surgery procedures or what we would code in the surgery section of the CPT manual, the common ones that we'd see in the office? And I've got a surprise for you because the, CE, or the uh, ones that I picked from the articles that I found, I divided up the doctor's office and the facility. So at the end, I'm going to tell you about the ones for the facility. We'll do those in another club webinar. The very first one was joint injections, abscess drainage, laceration repairs, wart treatment, skin tag removal, and foreign body removal. Now, again, there are more things that you'll see in the doctor's office. But when you're looking at the surgery section, of the code set, these are the ones that are very commonly done in the doctor's office. We're not going to be doing things like cholecystectomies and appendectomies and stent placements and things. Those are done in outpatient facilities or the facility itself. So focusing on the doctor's office, what I decided to do was take the procedure and then we're going to break it down and look at how to find it in the index. Look at the codes themselves. I'm going to show you about the BAT technique that we teach that Lorraine came out with in the late 90s. And then we're going to talk about how to get the right code via the report that's being written. And some other tips that maybe I can think of that... that um, uh, come off the top of my head. We're going to start with joint injections though. First we've got to understand what is a joint injection. Why would they actually give somebody an injection into the joint? 
top reason, chronic pain or the patient's having pain. Nothing's been able to alleviate the pain. My husband actually had this done for the first time uh, last week in his knee. He has a bum knee. He tore his ACL like 20 years ago. And off and on, he's had problems with his knee. But after we moved, he had a little spill and it got really bad. So he... Uh, went to see an orthopedist, they did some scans and, and manipulated the knee and looked at it and he said, you know what, well, they pulled some fluid off the knee and he said, I'm going to go ahead and give you an injection in the knee, let's see if this helps. So again, he was having pain that had lasted for more than a month and sometimes it was so bad that he would have to, you know, find a pain pill, dig through the cabinet and see if he could find something something that Tylenol and ibuprofen wasn't helping anymore. And then um, he, you know, done the icing, uh, the whole nine yards that you could do at home to take care of it. When you have a chronic pain in a joint, there can be several different reasons, but one of the reasons could be inflammation. And so they will inject a type of, uh, uh, steroid into the knee to kind of help with the inflammation to see if that helps. Uh, they could have chronic pain due to arthritis. That would help. Uh, I have a son that has rheumatoid arthritis. You may have heard me talk about him and he had a knee problem. And so once they got the inflammation controlled, he did really well after that. The key though for joint injections, what do we need to look for when we want to code the joint injection now that we know the purpose of it? It's called an atherocentesis and they can also do an aspiration. Sometimes they actually do both like my son or my husband had uh, fluid pulled off the knee aspiration but then they injected a fluid in a, a, a steroid in there as well. So the procedure itself reads a lot like what we're looking at here. Um, I was able to get this off find a code because that's the encoder that we use at CCO. I'm a big fan of them because they add this information so you can understand the procedure. I would encourage you also to jump out on YouTube and, you know, do a uh, search for a joint injection into a knee, uh, atherocentesis, and see if watching the procedure, because it's not a bloody it, procedure or gross, you know, if you are have a queasy stomach, it does involve needles, but again, it's you know, it is invasive because we're breaking the skin, but it's not as invasive as, as them cutting somebody open and replacing a knee. So I would encourage you again to, to watch one of those because as you watch it, then the description of what's being done will click in your brain and you'd be, you'll, you'll be able to code it better. Ultimately, uh, they numb the area and uh, that they're going to put the needle in. They will take a larger bore needle and then insert it into the joint and then they'll pull out fluid uh, and then uh, they'll turn around and inject the steroid. They, uh, it's pretty commonly done and easy to do in the office. They will take that fluid off uh, also and send it off to see if there is some type of an infection in there maybe that's causing the, the pain. So looking at the codes themselves, if you look uh, to look at the codes, you're going to look up injection and then you're going to go to joint. And if you look at 20600, your range is going to be 20600 through 20611 for injections of the joint what differentiates these codes and I divided them up into like three little paragraphs. For the first two codes 20600 and 20604 this is going to be for a small joint or bursa and if you don't know what the bursa is that's uh, that area where the joint 
meets. Uh, if there's at any time any of the verbiage that you don't no, write that down in your notebook or, or a piece of paper and go back and look that up. If you don't do that, then when you go to read these, if you're getting ready to test or just reading them for work, uh, you're going to slow down because your brain's going to think, no, what was the bursa again? You know, and you don't need to do that. Just you don't have to have it memorized. Just be familiar with the verbiage that you're going to see. The difference between the 20600 and the 20604 is the fact that you have ultrasound guidance. One has it and one does not. So the 20600 is without and the 20604 is with ultrasonic guidance. The reason they need to have guidance is because, again, they're not cutting open the joint to look at it, and they need to visualize where the injection is going. We don't want to, if we're doing a knee, we don't want to spear the ACL or one of the ligaments, right? Now, notice also as we're looking at these, you have 20600, and then it jumps to 604. You think, well, what's the codes in between? Well, there is no codes in between. So don't let that alarm you. Whereas 20605 and 20606, one right after the other, and then it jumps to 20610 to 20611. Again, that is common through the code set. It allows for expandability of the CPT code set. And from time to time, codes are dropped and revised. Uh, so, uh, again, there's not a lot of expandability with CPT, but there is areas where there, there is uh, extra characters that, can, that have not been used previously. So what is the difference for the 20600 and the 20604? Uh, it's a small joint or bursa, and it's with or with, uh, without ultrasonic guidance. And then we look at 20605, we have an intermediate joint or bursa, and then without the guidance, and then 20606, again, intermediate, with the guidance, and then we jump to 20610, which is a major joint or bursa, and then 20611 with guidance. So again, What's small? That's fingers and toes. Think fingers and toes. Intermediate would be uh, your shoulder, your wrist, your elbow, your ankles, uh, temporal mandibular, uh, mandibular, some people say right here. So uh, again, uh, up by the shoulder where uh, uh, the clavicular, right there. And then major joints are going to be uh, knees and hips and shoulders. All right, let's look at it a little more in depth. When we learn the bat technique, it's a bubble and highlighting technique. We're going to bubble, highlight, annotate technique. So at times you'll write notes out to yourself, but this is what you're going to do with your manual. So the 20600, you can circle that all the way down to 20611. That whole bubble is joint injections. And then within that bubble, you're going to underline the small joint or bursa, and then without ultrasound guidance and with ultrasound guidance, okay, with permanent recording and reporting, etc. So highlight everything after the semicolon, underline pertinent information before the semicolon, what separates and makes them different from other codes. So that's the BAT technique. And that is for our um, small, right? And then we're going to look at next intermediate joints. It even tells you what joints it is. We're underlining and we're highlighting with ultrasound or without ultrasound guidance and with ultrasound guidance with permanent um, recording and reporting. 
and then we jump in oop, uh, to the larger joint uh, would be the same thing. Okay. The next area that's very common to do procedures is abscess drainage. When you look up drainage in the index, so if you happen to have a manual with you, a CPT manual, you can open it up now and look up the term drainage. Now there's lots of things that we can drain, but we're specifically looking at abscesses. And you will find that uh, they will, sometimes they'll drain abscesses and sometimes they'll not drain them. They'll give an antibiotic and let them wait. But at some point, an abscess gets so painful that, you know, they'll give them an antibiotic, but they're going to have to relieve the pressure. It's like a little volcano waiting to happen. And it stretches out the skin and it's inflamed and hot, fills up with fluid. And an abscess is, you know, like an infection. So a little infection volcano. When you look at drainage, you're going to next look for the term abscess. After you find abscess, then it's further divided by all of the areas of the body that commonly have an abscess. And I went ahead and copied those for us. Uh, notice that they are located in different areas, meaning some of these codes start with a four, some start with a six, some start with a two, and some start with a three. Now, also go down and look under hip. It says image guided, right? That's important. You've got a one zero zero three zero, and then you've got a four nine four zero five through four nine four zero seven. Uh, sometimes you don't have further information in the index. The index is a starting point to get you to the right area. Then you're going to jump out to the code set description and find the one that is the most applicable. Okay. Uh, it Remember, it's a numerical code set. Now, this list is alphabetized, right, because we go from abdomen to lymph nodes. Again, what are we going to look at for a drainage, an abscess drainage? Now, I could have picked anything, but I wanted to kind of keep it simple uh, for us. So I went ahead and picked a finger. A, a lot of times an abscess, I've seen them do abscess on the fingers, but the, a lot of times they happen in the groin area or axillary under the arm and sometimes on the back. Again, get to the right area, then jump out to the main part of the codes with the description so that you can get to the highest specificity. Don't ever code from the index. So if we're going to code a finger abscess drainage, we have two code choices. We have 26010, which is drainage of a finger, and which is abscessed, simple. And then we have 26011, which again, drainage of a finger, complicated. And then it says, oh, by the way, fell on. And then I'll tell you more about what a fell on is here. It's not felon, but felon. And uh, that has to do with the fingers themselves. So when we're doing our bat technique, we would bubble these for abscess on a finger. We have highlighted everything behind the semicolon that's, that distinguishes the difference between these two codes, simple and complicated. And we're going to underline, well, what's the body part? Okay, it's the finger. When they do that, they it's a pretty rel relatively simple procedure. They're going to clean the area because we're going to break the skin. We want to make sure there's um, no germs there. They will give local anesthesia, which is usually pretty darn painful to do. Be it's as an over you know, it burns, it stings a little bit, uh, but you get relief right away. But with an abscess, sometimes you don't because you're just putting more fluid into that already uh, 
compacted area that's stretched out and inflamed. So again, if you go out and you look at abscess drainage, now this is something if you have a weak stomach, you may not want to go look at, but there's all kinds of these abscess drainage uh, procedures uh, on all over parts of the body that you can have done uh, or see on YouTube. So after they do that, then they're going to make an incision and they're just going to let the abscess drain. They're, and as soon as they open that up, the skin up and the fluid comes out, the patient gets almost instant relief after that. And then it'll be sore, but it's not that horrible pain that they were in before. Uh, then they may go in and clean the area the hole, the cavity, but again, they're careful because that's inflamed and irritated. They'll irrigate it a lot of times. They'll fill up a large syringe without a needle and they'll just squirt and let that drain out and clean it all up real good. So with 26010, that's a simple uh, drainage procedure. And then the 26011 would be more complicated because of the area that it's being done. A felon is uh, that nail fold on the finger and uh, that is a more difficult complex area to, to have to work on than just uh, an area on a meaty part of the finger. Next is a laceration repair. A lot of this is done in the doctor's office. Now, uh, probably not as much maybe as was done before we had urgent cares. You know, now, if you live in a relatively large area, you have an urgent care. And if you live in, uh, close to you, and if you live in a city, there just seems to be one on every corner and some that even specialize like pediatric urgent cares and stuff. But laceration is any time you have a cut. So when you go to look at this in the index, the key term to look under is going to be repair. After you look at repair, then you have to know, well, what's the body part that we're going to repair? And just because it says laceration doesn't mean that if you go and you look at arm 26548, that doesn't mean it's a repair of a laceration because a repair is a very broad term. And therefore, you'll notice these codes are pretty. Um, they're, all of these are two, starts with a two. But if we're going to look at a laceration repair, like a cut, then we're looking at the body area as the skin. And so I picked skin and highlighted it. And we have the choice between 13120 through 13122. So to further look at that, we would then move to uh, the main part of your coding manual. And when you look at the heading, you'll notice when you go to 12020, when you look above that, it's going to say, repair and then it's going to say simple procedures on the integumentary system because it's the skin and then it's going to say treatment of superficial wound dehesance. Now if you don't know what a dehesance is, in the past they didn't use this term for a laceration. Uh, it was after you'd had a procedure done and you have a, a cut, you know, where they sutured you or closed you back up and if it comes open you know, so maybe it came open just a little area, maybe on one end or the other, and uh, you get a little opening where it's not sealing well. Uh, maybe you popped a few stitches or something. They would call that a dehesance. But ultimately, it's a splitting of a wound along a suture line. Okay, so they'll clean the wound and they'll trim the area if it's ragged. And uh, they, the reason they do that is they want to make sure that it's got good blood flow because you can't heal unless you, got, you have good blood flow. And so again, they, they try to make you bleed when they get that 
going and then the all of the good stuff that the blood click carries not only the platelets but uh, the white blood cells and the oxygen from the red blood cells all clump together and promote healing now the 12020 is just going to be a simple closure and that means they can do sutures, they can do staples, or they could do the uh, uh, the tape, which they uh, call those butterfly butterfly bandages. They even have glue now that they use quite a bit. I know that when I had my gallbladder out a long time ago, it seems like now, they they did do a, a quick stitch underneath uh, to close the port area, but they just put glue on the top. <laughs> And I thought that was kind of crazy that I expected to see some stitches. Now, when you look at 12021, it's the same thing, but they've left packing. Now, this is a dishesence. This means that something has opened back up. So if we're doing a laceration repair, it's a little bit different than a dishesence. And uh, you, with uh, the packing, they won't leave anything um, stitch above that. They'll pack it up real good with this medicated, looks like bias tape if you've sewn before. And then they'll let that heal and then they'll pull that out. So that's for a superficial wound of a dishesance. What if we're going to do a repair on the integumentary system, but this is a cut, not a dishesance, okay? This is divided up into intermediate, and notice uh, I uh, was going to say the arm, okay? And if you look at these codes, this you could even bubble around 21031 through 21037. You could bubble them and know that all of these are intermediate repairs and they include the scalp, the axlia, that's under the arm, the trunk, which means the chest or back, and or extremities and they include the hands and feet. So if you have a laceration on the arm and you're going to do an intermediate repair, the next thing you have to ask yourself is, and you would look at the report, how, how long of the repair would it be? And they always put the length in there. That's standard procedures to measure the length. So if it's 2.5 centimeters or less for intermediate repair, it'd be 12031. If it's over 30 centimeters, it's going to be 12037. So notice the code range there. So you say, well, how do I know it's an intermediate repair? Well, a lot of times the provider will state intermediate repair. However, you also have to be able to tell the difference between a simple repair and an intermediate repair. And whenever they do an intermediate repair, they'll always numb the area and they'll tell you what they numbed it with. And then, uh, you know, they'll clean it, they'll numb it. And then with intermediate, we're going to have a layered closure. That means we're not just doing a whip stitch on the top. Okay, or individual sutures on the top. We're actually going to suture underneath and pull the tissue together like this. So here's our cut. We're going to do a stitch here to pull the, the meat together and then they'll do a stitch on the top to close that because we don't want a pocket. If we have a pocket, then all of those blood cells, the platelets, the white blood cells, the red blood cells, they get in there, they can form a clot, but they uh, you usually make a hematoma, but that's a warm, moist, uh, dark spot that can lead to infection. So we know that they're going to list a type of suture that will be under the skin that's going to dissolve. And then there'll be a different type of suture, different name for it and different size on the top layer. So you'll always see two different types of suture thread.
Then um, they may do undermining. They may, you know, do a little repair there sometimes. Uh, but those are absorbable sutures on the inside. And then they'll put the, what they call, uh, uh, I call them top stitch, but they're superficial because if you've sewn, you think of it as a top stitch. And those will come out seven to 10 days. That's what they usually say. So what is a complex repair then? So we've, did, we've done simple. We've talked about simple. We then talked about uh, intermediate and then complex. Complex is divided differently. Now, this is of the skin, remember. And we're looking at three codes, 13120, 13121, and 13122. With complex, they've stated scalp, arms, and or legs. And then they're saying the size again. So we've got 1.1 centimeter to 2.5, all the way up to an add-on code, which, which is the one. 3122, which is use additional five centimeters or less. Okay, so you have to use that code with one of the uh, other two codes. One, well, it would be 13121 plus 13122 for each additional five centimeters. And we need to understand what a complex repair is. So again, layered you're going to have absorbable sutures underneath the, the layer holding the, the wound together and then they're going to put top stitches. But what makes it different in that it being complex is it's not just layered. They're going to have to do other things. Maybe the first example they're given here is a scar revision. So they've got a scar and it's problematic. It's, it's uh, for whatever reason, they need to get rid of the scar. So they're going to cut around the scar and take all the scar tissue and they would make it deep and then remove that, kind of like they would do a lesion, make the edges very smooth, pull it together nice and neat and make one nice smooth um, suture. Uh, line. Uh, it could be scar revisions for burns. It could be, you know, uh, uh, a wound that hadn't been properly uh, taken care of and so it left a really bad scar and then it's making it difficult for the patient to use their hands maybe. There's also debridement, meaning there's gunk. There's something down in there. Uh, if you have a person that has had, say, a bike wreck, a motorcycle accident, something where they get like road rash and lots of debris in the wound itself, they've got to debride that, take out the non-viable tissue that the vascular system is shot. It's not, you know, remove all of that, pull the good viable tissue together. Uh, maybe there's extensive undermining. So when I told you they close that under, you know, uh, area first, they call that undermining. And when you have to do that a lot in a very large wound per se, or they, it's in an area that they have to undermine because that's an area that moves. Um, also, they could put in stents or they could put in retention sutures, which is a different type of suture that ends up being for a movable area. Again, uh, you're going to see words like subcutaneous tissue, dermis, epidermis uh, uh, used as far as you know, where they're, how deep they're going. Uh, sometimes they'll talk about the muscle having to suture under, doing undermining in, at the uh, muscle level. Next is wart treatment. You know what? Forts are very common and you can get them anywhere on your body. And for the most part, uh, sometimes they go away on their own. Sometimes you can go get over the counter treatments for them and remove them. But ultimately, what you need to know is that a wart is a virus and it makes roots and you got to get down and kill the root. So there's sometimes it doesn't work to have it done in um, 
uh, yourself. Now, my youngest, he had gotten a, uh, a wart on his hand, and then he got another one. I didn't think about much about it, but it was just a, like a little, uh, it was the color of his skin. It wasn't even colored. And then it was like he got up one day, maybe I wasn't paying attention, and he had several on his arm and his hand and even had some on his other hand. I was like, oh my gosh, this is spreading. Maybe this is something else. So I ended up taking him in and saying, you know, is this, you know, I thought warts were always colored and these are these skin colored bumps. And, you know, is there something else? Is, is it a wart? Uh, you know, do I need to be concerned? And uh, they're multiplying. And the doctor had stated that it's not unusual but what happened was it was his left arm that was just seemed to explode in these little bumps and it's because at night he was scratching them and spreading the virus all over his left arm because he was scratching with his right arm and so he had some on his hand but then they were just popping up so he said I'll just freeze them off they'll they'll fall off and they won't go back but make sure to tell you know he was saying telling him don't don't be scratching at night wash your hands when you go to bed you know wash your hands real good when you get up in the morning and if you have to cover your hands with something so you're not scratching them and they went away very quickly uh, however I, I didn't realize all of that so they are a virus that means they're contagious and there's several ways to remove them they can freeze them ultimately that's what the cryo sur you know, surgery, that's what they did. They can do minor surgery where they cut them off and freeze them, or they can use the creams and things. Now, the doctor's office can use a stronger cream than you can get over the counter. But that's the way it works. So how we code this? Well, it's on the integumentary system, and we're destroying it. So it's a destruction. And it's uh, using laser surgery, electro surgery, cryo surgery, chemo surgery surgical curatment meaning cut it off and this would be a benign lesion because that's what a wart is it's a lesion but it's benign and you have to remember not to lump this in with skin tags because it's not a skin tag okay skin tags have their own codes and we'll talk about that as well right here uh, if you're doing skin tag removal there's two codes one one two zero zero which is removal of the skin tag up to and including 15 lesions it doesn't matter where they are on the body a lot of times you get skin tags around the neck and under the arms you can get them in the groin area it's a usually a place that has repetitious movement and then one one two zero one is an add-on code and notice that it says each additional 10 lesions so for the bat technique, we are highlighting everything after the semicolon, and then we're underlining anything that makes a difference between the two codes, which is the add-on code 11201, additional 10 lesions. So again, these are just little projections of skin. They can be found all over the body. They'll just maybe numb it a little bit. And um, one of the things that they do often is just um, cut it off. Now they can use a scalpel or they could, they've got a little curved pair of scissors that have little teeth on them that you can't see, it's very fine. And But one thing you don't do when you do that is you don't grab the skin, leash, the skin tag with a pair of tweezers and pull up and then cut because then it'll fall down and make a hole in your skin. You want to cut it with the skin. So only two codes for that. Foreign body removal. If we're going to remove a foreign body, you can have a foreign body anywhere on the body for all kinds of re reasons. So I looked in the index and I you looked up removal because you're removing a foreign body so it's removal what are we removing a foreign body and then there's a whole line of locations to remove the foreign body from so it's based on location and I just picked out something simple uh, I started with uh, an eyelid so if we have a foreign body on the eyelid 
then uh, it tells us, the index tells us to go to 67938. What do we need to know? We need to know that it doesn't matter if it's the top eyelid or the bottom eyelid that we're, and it doesn't matter what the foreign body is. We're removing a foreign body. That's the code you're going to use. But if you have to do a repair after the removal of the foreign body, then you're going to go to a different code range, which is going to look under repair and then of the skin, what, where's it at? What part of the skin? eyelid and then notice we have several code ranges to look at for the repair. Sometimes the repair is more complex than the removal of the foreign body and that means the repair would be sequenced first. Another area that uh, was to remove a foreign body, I picked this one the 43275 because I wanted you to know that sometimes a foreign body is produced by the body. So if we have a uh, stone in the biliary or pancreatic duct, it would be a foreign body and it, they would go in and do an endoscopic, meaning they would go in with a camera and look retrograde and I don't know if I even want to try to say that word. Uh, I'll try so you can have a good giggle. Let's see. Cololangiopancreatography. Or we'd never say that. We would just say uh, an ERCP. You know, with removal of foreign body. So that's what you're underlining. And then you're highlighting everything behind the semicolon. And then I went ahead and copied from Find a Code the description of how they would do that. And that is going to be looking at uh, that area between the pancreas, the gallbladder, the common bile duct, and the biliary duct. And stones will often get caught in there. So they'll go in with a wire and they'll grab them and try to pull those out. And sometimes they use contrast material to be able to see that. Uh, so uh, if they use contrast material, then that would be a different code. Now, wrapping up, I wanted to tell you that I, in addition, looked at the common ones in the doctor's office, but then the top 15 for facilities, outpatient facility a lot of times, but not always. And um, this is the list that I got, and we're going to do that in another club, CCO Club webinar, and break those down. Now, I didn't want to do that with this one because these are much more intense. There's more things that you need to be aware of when you're coding these. So we're going to divide these up and bring them to you at a later date and continue to really highlight the surgery section and the common procedures that you're going to see in the surgery section. Maybe not necessarily ones that you're going to be tested on if you're getting ready to take a certification exam, but real life practical looking them up and, and uh, getting to the highest specificity for the procedure and maybe even looking at some of the diagnosis codes to go along with those. So again, keep these in mind. If there are some that are very common in your office or your facility that you want to know more about and you're a club member, absolutely let us know. Say, hey, will you, uh, I didn't see this particular procedure, add it. And I'd love to get more information on make, and make sure I'm coding this to the highest specificity. All right, so that being said, we'll open up to, for some questions. All right, now I've seen you guys asking questions throughout, but uh, let me just scroll real quick. Courtney, I'm so glad you're taking the CRC exam. Very good for you. And... Um, Wow, I'm seeing where every, oh, Roseanne, uh, Rosanda asked, is ultrasound guidance billed separately? What you're going to look for when you um, uh, are looking at those codes, if 
it's going to be billed separately. It will not be included in the code description. So anytime it's used and it's not included in that description, then there is an additional code to use. And don't worry, because that particular code is probably listed underneath your code. And it says, it'll say, you know, if guidance was used, and then it will list a whole line of codes. And then you can go and look at those and see which one is applicable to the procedure that was done. So they, there is not a yes and no answer to that. Sometimes you do code it separately, and sometimes you don't. Just pay attention to that. Uh, and I, I think that was about the time we were talking about injections. So again, definitely for injections. However, across the board, any procedure that is going to have guidance of any type, whether it's ultrasound, fluoroscopic, um, any type with contrast of some type, if it's not included in the description of the code, then you're probably going to use an additional code. However, the description will tell you heads up or look at the NCCI edits and it'll tell you, you don't code this code with this code. That'd be another area to look. The more you do procedures in an office, um, the uh, some of these, you don't have to have them memorized, but you may get them memorized because they're so common, especially the ones that we talked about or very common doctor's office ones. Uh, let me just look and see. Uh, da, 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 da. I think the question was answered about the uh, HEMA and AAPC. They they coexist as far as CEUs are concerned now. So that's good. Now let's go back and see if we got some new ones. Uh, Jane said, I know you must use the uh, PCS code set for inpatient surgeries. Um, how do you learn this? We have a great course on ICD-10 PCS. If you, uh, Jane, are thinking about uh, doing inpatient coding. If you need a course, we have a course for it. But if you're just wanting to know more about ICD-10 PCS, we have a lot of videos in our club. I would urge you to go ahead and also look out at our YouTube channel and see those as well. We've talked about it quite a bit. Once you get the knack of PCS and you get the root operations, the code set's actually pretty easy to use. It uh, is a, a multi-axial uh, code set. So it, um, uh, you're going to have standards for each column that you're filling in or each block. I like to think of them as, as blocks and you're flipping. And uh, once you flip one block, all of the other blocks are um, going to be directly related to that box. And then you flip another box and assign that character. And then the remaining ones will only be applicable to this one. And so again, as long as you stay on the right track, you're golden, but uh, PCS, we have a lot of help with it. Uh, you can check out on the cco.us website as well as in our club. Um, great stuff in there. And then if there's something specific you want to know procedures for PCS, let me know and we'll do that. Now, it is a different code set than CPT and um, uh, so some of those that you saw on that list say a mastectomy. Uh, you know, we could we could code those out with PCS if you if you're interested in having that. Can you bill for two injections at one visit? Uh, the way I understand it, Gloria, is that you can bill for two injections if it's not in the same body part. So you couldn't do uh, you, you couldn't do a a knee two injections in a knee. Uh, you can code for two separate knees two different body parts uh, and then you could also code for like a hip and a knee the way I understand it uh, that would be a great question to put in the club Gloria because uh, uh, Jennifer is an excellent biller and she would be able to give you some additional insight when you go to code for that but uh, that's pretty standard with CPT you can't you don't really call that double dipping. However, think of it this way. If it's very common to give two injections for a specific procedure, meaning two different injections into one knee for whatever reason, uh, then there's going to be a code for that. If it's not common, 
there won't be a code. Okay, but anytime you do a procedure, a surgery procedure on a body part, you can do the same procedure the same day on another body part, but not the same body part without modifiers and other things uh, being used. I hope that answers your question. But if you give a scenario like, you know, two injections in one knee, probably not. An injection into uh, uh, both knees, bilateral injections for both knees possibly. A shoulder and a hip? Yeah, you can do that. Uh, S. Hansen says, can we talk about procedures having inherent e &Ms, no separate e &M build with procedures and CPTs? Very good point. There are some procedures that have the e &M built in, uh, meaning that you don't get to code an e &M and the procedure separately. Um, I would need to go and look some of those up because I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, but uh, most everything is a procedure. The reason you, the e &M would be built in is because it was so commonly done. Again, like I mentioned before, that there's a code for the e &M, everything's together. Whereas things like cleaning out cerumen in the ears, you know, you can do the e &M and then uh, you would be able to, to use the code for uh, the lavage of the ears, one ear, both ears, and then there's different types of lavage that you can do and that would distinguish um, those. Uh, now, sometimes if a person comes in for their annual wellness visit and they also have their, then you would use a modifier to separate that stuff out. But we can definitely do that if you want to give us an example, because uh, uh, I can't. I apologize for not being able to think of one off the top of my head. Um, yes, Angela O said she looked at some abscess videos. So very gross. So uh, again, it's like a vault. It's like a pus volcano. <laughs> and you know, you could have a really small abscess. It doesn't look very big, and have a lot of fluid, uh, especially for like things on a back. You would you would think. You know, it may not look like there's much of a, a rise there, you know, but um, man, it, it goes deep instead and uh, really painful. So sometimes they, they'll pack them and then they'll wait and they'll come back. Some of them take a very long time to heal up because they're so deep. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Ear lavage is, is cleaning out the ear, cerumen in the ear. Ear lavage. And um, uh, they're just... Lavage just means you're squirting it with water, using water to, to clean it out. All right, Jane, thank you. All right, I think that's all the questions that we have, and we're right there close to the hour. Um, oh, wait, I see a couple. Uh, let's see. What's the highest level you can get for an office suture removal? Office suture removal when the MA removes versus the MD. Uh, if, the, if the provider doesn't do it and the... Uh, MA or the nurse or the technician, you aren't going to be able to get much of anything, Whitney. I, um, because the provider didn't do it. And uh, there's no medical decision making there, you know, so it'll be the lowest that you can do unless there's something complicated. Uh, still modifier 25 with EM with an additional procedure. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Example, lavage, joint injection, inherent e &M. Oh, oh, yes, okay. I, I won't be able to say much of those without um, looking more for S. Hansen. But I'll make a note of that. I'll write that down and, um, and, and, and we'll do some more information on inherent e &Ms. And if you're in the club, we'll go ahead and put it in the club as well because those will be helpful to everybody in the club. That's the purpose. Okay, guys, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining us, and I look forward to next time. We're back on track, I think. So uh, just real quickly, uh, referenced the, where I found that information that we talked about today. Uh, if you're in the club, you'll get a copy of this as well as the slide deck, but it's exclusive for the club members. Thanks for joining us and uh, don't forget to go out to cco.us forward slash club.